Thank you so much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Salawat. Well, it's not an interview. I actually run a program on Alabad TV every Sunday, and it's all related to medical issues. Um, these lectures I've been doing, we've been gathering for the last um, four months, and the previous series also we had several lectures. It's a part of activity that uh, Mami Medics International is doing. We have launched a university. It's a virtual university called Medics International Virtual University. And uh, because it's slightly outside the domain of normal learning procedures and teaching procedures like medicine, etc., we've broadened the scope of this university to include logic, uh, philosophy, metaphysics, aesthetics, even cosmology, apart from medical subjects. So it's a series I've been doing for the last um, two years. And again, today I'm going to talk about... Uh, some interesting issues, and uh, the program that has been recorded will be shown earlier on uh, before my recording is on organ transplant by a famous surgeon called Abbas Ghazanfar, who was at St. George's Hospital. So, and I see Mudassir is here, he's been running a program on Alabad TV also. Uh, so, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, is it Alabad? Yeah, you did. Sorry. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we'll start straight away because I'll take about 10, 15 minutes and then I have to move on. Should I show the slides from here or would you? Okay, and uh, I can read from here. Yeah, Remote from here. Now, I was born before these things. I might struggle. <laughs> All right. So could I say next and that'll be a lot easier for me because, you know, Prefer that. Com computers came much later. I was born, but even, yeah. So I think, uh, so. So we're going to talk about ethical and theosophical debate, and I would call it theosophical because it's a combination of ethics and theology. And I think this is a field which has been there for a long, long time, but for some reason, medicine has forgotten it. And I'm trying my hard to bring it back into medical curricula. Um, in my previous life, when I was a dean of a medical school in Pakistan, I tried very hard to bring logic, physics, uh, philosophy, and metaphysics, but I failed. But when I went to Barbados to establish a medical school for Mami Medics, I included that, because that is a part of it. So theosophy, I think, is an interesting uh, subject. So we're going to talk about organ donation and org organ harvesting. Next, please. Should I try this anyway? Oh, it's working. But it won't work from here then. So let's have a look at the magnitude of problem. And uh, this is a data that I recently gathered uh, through Ghazanfar, Abbas Ghazanfar. Uh, this is only about kidney, but you've got all the other organs as well. Three people die each day waiting for a kidney only, let, about, let alone pancreas and lungs and liver, liver and other things. 10,000 patients are on the wait list for organs to be transplanted. Next, please. Now, what is important is that these are the topics that we can discuss. Each one is a lecture in its own right, but I'll just go through it simply. What is that? How do you prepare for organ transplantation? The nature of a disease is important. The rate of decline of glomerular filtration rate, primary or secondary glomerular disease, availability of kidney donor, kidney sharing scheme. This is fantastic. Kidney sharing scheme has been going on for some time here, and Abbas told me that they have a fair number of um, patients who are, who are on this list. Uh, the problem is that not many Asian communities come forward, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Then there is a na national disease donor guidelines, and then patients of willingness for transplant, which is a very important subject, and I hope somebody will touch upon it later on, because in Asian communities, it's a major issue. Next, please. Now, the ethical question that comes up is the organ donation. We know that it's established practice in all countries in the world, including Islamic countries, but the timing of the organ harvesting is still an issue, because in some circles, the definition of death remains controversial. And I've had this debate in Qum and Najaf, and also Sheikh is sitting here. He'll guide us, and I'm only a humble student of students uh, of ethics, so I need to learn from experts like him. Next, please. 
Now, this is a concept that's already there in Wales, and it's also in part of the uh, United States of America. Only a couple of weeks ago, on a Sunday morning in that program, which is um, about moral issues, etc., I can't remember what it was, uh, there was this debate that they're starting the process of consultation with the general public to start this uh, concept, the principle of presumed consent, which means that it will be taken for granted that you have given permission to harvest your organs, unless you opt out. So the option will be the opting out. They're still debating over it. And I think there was a wonderful discussion. Uh, it's been recorded by uh, uh, somebody, and I, I expect that if you can have a look at it, it will be wonderful. Now, there is this importance of will. Will is a very important thing, and I think a lot of us, uh, including myself, until recently, I had not written a will. But when, for, when I went for Hajj, uh, I was told by the Sheikh that you must write a will. And since then, I tried to upkeep and uh, maintain the will. Will is important, in which you should also mention about your instructions about donation of organs. DNR and DNR, which I believe has been discussed before, this is a subject in its own right, and perhaps at a later stage, sometimes if we have debate, we can come and talk about it later. So we have to have the options, because there was a story recently in the paper that a lady uh, who had not given the permission for do not resuscitate, she went through a lot of problem, and uh, that was in, in uh, several newspapers. So I think it's important that we remember that. Next, please. This is a very traditional old rule. It's been there for a long, long time. Now, in ethics, there are three principles, uh, and I'm just mentioning it. Virtue ethics, which is my favorite. Then there's deontological ethics, which is later introduced by Immanuel Kant, and then utilitarianism. Stuart Miller and things, sometimes maybe you can discuss at some stage. So according to the deontic, deontic, deontic rule, this, this categorically pro prohibits removal of the organs leading to death. That means you cannot remove from a living person. It assures patients, physicians, families, and relevant people that a person who is brain dead is in fact dead, because that is the controversy. Is brain dead is really dead or not? And we'll talk about that in a minute. So that is an important thing, and one has to be uh, to remember this rule. This is called DDR. A lot of Americans use this terminology, DDR. Okay. Next, please. Now, live donors are the best. If you can find a live donor, that is the ideal thing. But in Asian communities, it's a major problem. Major problem. It's been there for discussed at various levels. Thalassemia is a major issue. Organ transplantation is a major issue. Lots of things. And there is, therefore, an acute shortage of organ donation in the Asian communities. Altruism is a part of our cultures. But why is it not an essential part of our activities in organ donation? I fail to understand. Because we are willing to give everything, sacrifice, charity, etc., altruism, but not in terms of organ donation. And that is a matter that we should discuss. Next, please. Now, this is uh, Human Tissue Act has been there for a long, long time. In the UK, it, it is illegal to buy or sell an organ. Organ theft and trading is a major industry in the developing countries, and I know it for myself in Pakistan, because Adib Rizvi and I literally worked together in civil hospital Karachi many, for many, many years. It used to be a major. People would sell their kidney, even their children, for a transplant. It's a known thing. It's been in India as well. This question that's cropping up recently, it came up in Scotland, and it has been discussed in Iran also. Should a certain amount be paid to the donor? Not as, as a cost, not as buying the organ, but in terms of logistic support, like traveling, <coughs> etc., etc. In Iran, they have started to a certain extent, because I was there in 2015. We had discussion with Dr. Larajani, who's a famous ethicist, and they are also starting this thing, a small amount could be given for that. But that is something that um, is coming up as well. Next, please. This is standard practice now throughout the world. And again, I'll quote Professor Adib Rizvi. You people might be familiar with his name. He is a legend uh, in Pakistan who established SIU to Sin Institute of you know, Urology and Transplantation. Imtiaz, you must know him. Sorry? Oh, mashallah, mashallah. Professor of Nephrology here in the Oh, mashallah, mashallah. So Adib and I, we used to work together. We literally joined the civil hospital together. He's senior to me, of course. 
but he's a legend. He really fought for years to get this rule passed from the parliament that cadaver donation is, and it has become a regular feature now in SIUT and Kidney Center in, in Karachi and Lahore, I'm sure in India as well. I don't know about India, what's the situation there? And of course, there are some religious and ethical issues that still exist. Now, sanctity of life, can we have the next slide, please? I don't have to repeat. This is the motto of Imamia Medics International, uh, and that is the reason I'm quoting here. One cannot deny the fact that sanctity of life is universal and it has to be observed. This is a quote from Imam Ali, and I actually picked it up from Maulana Kosar Niazi, who was a very famous journalist in Pakistan. And Kosar Niazi was given this quote by Rajiv Gandhi. So he went to see Rajiv Gandhi, and Rajiv Gandhi said that I've got a small thing which somebody gave it to me, I keep it with me all the time. It said, death itself is a protected, hisar hai, zindagi ka hisar maut khud hai. A death is a blessing in some situations, and surgeons like here, uh, all of us, who well, are there, are many surgeons, we have experienced. Uh, I mean, I'm a head and neck surgeon basically. In Malaysia, I remember I used to work in Kuala Lumpur and Penang, in these places. Many patients in misery would say that, please pray for us that we'll die. Because if you could not operate, they lived in agony, there were no support, no social services. So death is a blessing in some situations. Next, please. But of course, we know that death is no more than a transition of roof from bodily casket to alam e arwa. Am I? Thank you. Noble Quran clearly mentions ruh as an amr rabbi, an act of God, and we don't know the actual facts about ruh as we should, in fact. Neither do we know when ruh enters. And I've used the word emerges because in one of the debates I had a discussion that Ruh, how does it enter? I mean, we don't know. The old traditional thing was that it, it stays in pineal body. That was Aristotle said, the Plato's, uh, Plato said, Aristotle said, and in later days, Descartes said it too. But now it's been discarded. As we know, the pineal body has nothing to do with it. So I use the word emerges, and this is a question of debate. Sometimes one wonders that the whole process of that chemical interaction that's happening in the, in, the, um, in the comfort of the uterus, which is like an incubator, a natural incubator, probably rue is there, but emerges at a certain point. And this is a debatable thing, very controversial. Okay? And of course, uh, we have this controversy of definition of death, which continues to baffle us. And I am totally baffled, and I've discussed this. I sat at the feet of learned scholars like uh, Agha Misbah Yazdi and various other people, and this debate goes on. Sheikh Bashir Najafi, in um, 2016, I had discussion with him. I'm not clear, and that is a question. Somebody has to guide me. So the question is that is it the brain death or the death of the heart which matters? Because harvesting will depend on that. Next, please. I think this gentleman is very good. He's doing. Now, it is believed by religious scholars it was in Qum and also in Najaf. We had massive debates, a lot of people. In one particular session, there were about 1,500 people, he, numerous scholars, and everybody condemned me when I said that is brain death. Uh, really, two or three of them who were doctors, also my students, ulama from uh, Al Mustafa and other, uh, other places, they say, no, it's qalb ki maut, marge qalb, marge qalb. All right, so what is qalb? The definition of death is important. I believe it's been discussed before, but it's important because of time of timing of the organ harvesting. Next, please. Next, please. Scientific debate revolves in death being the death of the brain and CNS, neurological and not the heart, not cardiac death. Because if that was the case, I would have been dead. I had a cardiac arrest in 2014. I had a cardiac tamponade. I went into the white tunnel. And I swear I had a mojiza. And I'm a humble servant of Mawla Abbas. I had a ziyarat, I didn't see his face. And I'm doing all this work that I'm doing in the name of Mawla Abbas. He gave me the life. I'm such a... So if I was, if cardiac death was death, then I shouldn't be sitting here. So I think that's personal experience, okay? So the problem also is that if cardiac death is a final death, then should we do the CPR and BLS or not? 
That's the question. It becomes very difficult, ethically and morally and scientifically and legally. As physicians, we are obliged to do it. We cannot not do it. This whole debate started when the first heart trans heart trans Can I have the next slide, please? When the first heart transplant was performed in 1967 by a doctor, Christian Bernard, at Grootshore Hospital in South Africa. Uh, in 1968, next please. Um, he recorded an interview which was recently aired on BBC Four. And this I've been saying for a long, long time. I was a student in 1968 uh, at the Royal College of Surgeons doing my primary FRCS, and wonderful teachers like Professor Last, who taught me anatomy, and Professor David Sloan, top class physician. Nobody taught us about immunology. Immun immunology in 1968 did not exist. It was in 1969 that immunology first came into life and into open debates by a chap called Professor Turk. That was the year when Christian Bernard complained that why did he not get the Nobel Prize? Because the prize was given to Professor Coombs of the Coombs test, because that is how the immunology and all these things came. So the reason I'm saying is that probably this heart transplant that Christian Bernard did, he did without tissue matching. And I'm not sure if it's ethical or not, but that is a debatable thing. So what is... Can, so if it is qalb ki maut or marya qalb, then what is qalb? Next. I'll go through it quickly because I have to finish off. Imam Ali says that a believer's moment's tongue follows his heart and the heart of the hypocrite munafiq follows his tongue. So it is the heart, the, the pumping thing, or is something else? Qalb, shaur, cognizance, consciousness. We'll just go into a little bit of metaphysics. What is qalb? Is it a metaphorical term? What is shaur and does it rest in qalb? That is the question. If we can establish it, then I think the problem will be solved. Heart is a seat of emotions, and Eastern cultures particularly, it's not Easter, I'm sorry for this mistake, heart has always been the seat of emotions and passions. Allama Iqbal is a famous philosopher and poet. His famous quote is, and I have to say it in Urdu, I've translated though here, but let me just read. It is essential that the reason accompanies heart at all times, but leaves it alone once in a while. Is it possible to remember? It is possible to remember. But it is possible to leave it alone. That is important. Uh, and of course, there is the famous Allah Iqbal Singh. Be khatar kut pada, aatashe namrood mein ishq, Reason was waiting and ish jumped into it. Heart is the seat of ishq. Okay. So heart, does it mean heart means mind? This is, of course, something that I'll just skip it because I have to hurry up. Taste. Taste is a sensory perception. So where is it? Is it in the mind or is it the heart? That is the question. Is qalb a metaphorical expression of the sensory neural system? That is the question I raise. In Quran, the nomenclature for heart, and learned scholars are sitting here, I'm only a student, the four letters, four terms have been used for heart. Qalb, Lub, Fuad, and Sadr. Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam, Allahumma salli ala wa Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. He explained that Quran is four different aspects, expression for general people, illusions for the privilege or the elite, lataif, touches of grace for the saints, and realities for prophets. So it's different levels of intelligence. Next, please. The definition of qalb and for the symbols of consciousness, shaur, that is mind, and not the physical <coughs> organ called the heart. This is Surah Anam, and the reference is given here. And I have particularly, I'm grateful to Dr. Hassan Zaidi, he's a famous surgeon. People know him, I think he's been around for a long time. He actually helped me two, three years ago doing this research. We were doing debates in Kufa and Najaf. These are different references. Quranic references are given here, and there are about seven other references about Qalb. Famous scholar, Dr. N. Uh, Mary Shamel, and I had the pleasure of meeting her personally in Pakistan on two, three occasions. 
great philosopher. Uh, she says this on heart. The concept of qalb was also defined, quoting Sadr is breast, Quran's reference is given here. Qalb is also connected with iman and faith, the reference is given there. Fuad is connected with marifa, gnosis, and lub is connected with tawheed, the different terminologies used in Quran. Imam al-Sadiq also said that aql, reason is as the barrier between the nafs and qalb, the barrier that cannot, that cannot transcend. Now this briefly I'll go through it, and that's the end of in about five, six minutes. Death is it somatic, biological, or brain death. And of course, doctors know it, that a team of physicians, neurologists, anesthesiologists, ICU, etc., they have to gather together classically to decide if a person is dead or not, but you don't need it all the time because as physicians we know that we can identify through physical signs and certain tests uh, that have to be carried out. And of course, it's said that keep looking for the signs of life. Death may be declared only after complete cessation of a recordable electrical act uh, activity in brain. And the new thing that's come up in the last two, three years, I believe, probably more, is brain perfusion studies. Timing. The human heart and bodily organs can be artificially kept alive indefinitely after brain, brain death. This would give time for organ harvesting. But how long? That is the question. Eventually, the organs will decay. The enigma of death is more mysterious than the life per se. Brain may not yet die for some time, raising the question of an appropriate timing of organ harvesting. Somebody sent me a video, and I had it here, but that is only, that's a bit long video, so I've cut it off. It shows that even after complete cessation of electri electrical activity, the brain continues to fire. From amygdala, from the hippocampus, and last part of the brain that dies, that does not, uh, that uh, stops firing the sparks, is the frontal cortex. And before that happens, for about five to seven minutes, it takes you back to the initial four years of your life. So you go to life, your earliest part of life, and you remember all your seniors and people who've gone up. Amazing video. And I'm going to record it on Elevate TV, which I'll copy to you later. Amazing. And the question that arises is that even after 10 minutes or 15 minutes, if the brain is it's still active, what is the time when you decide that the brain is actually dead? <clears throat> Two years ago, in National Geographic, there was a beautiful, beautiful edition. It was dedicated to death. You should read it. Amazing. There are people in certain parts of the world where go, they go into a state of self-induced coma. I think in uh, somewhere in Lima or Peru. For six months, they go into negative metabolism, right? And the brain activity is zero, everything, but survive. So what is death? That is the dilemma. So my question is, is brain dead really dead? Does brain death mean that the soul has actually left the body? Because we don't know what, what time soul leaves. Okay? What is the status of ruh during assisted living when you put the patient on ventilator? Right? So if the brain is dead but the organs are working, is the ruh still there or not? Because we don't know what time when the ruh enters or leaves. So how do we know if the organ harvesting or indeed the burial rituals are performed only after the body becomes soulless? We don't know. Experiments have been done, and somewhere else I'm going to talk about it. Experiments have been done recently to weigh the body at the last minute, and there was no difference. All they found was that the, the caliber they were using tilted a little bit towards a negative. It's a beautiful study, and if you want, I can give you the references. Okay? Last. So, is qalb a metaphorical expression of sensory neural component? If so, then the controversy may be resolved. Because then we are talking of the same thing, qalb or consciousness. Personally, I believe that qalb means a spiritual heart, that is mind. This is what is interesting. Emerging frontiers. All these conversations we're doing, maybe in two years' time, will be obsolete. 3D printing and organ cultivation is rapidly gaining grounds. Everybody knows it's happening. Once the in vitro organs are freely available, the debate on the cadaveric donation will become obsolete, just as the harvesting 
two, three years ago, I remember, I had a debate with Fatima, Fatima Obstetrician, and we were talking about the harvesting of uh, embryos which are produced extra in IVF and use it for stem cell research. And we discuss it. Fatima is a very learned uh, uh, lady. I think she's been here or maybe somewhere. The same thing, it doesn't apply anymore. You don't need spare embryos now because you can harvest stem cells from any from adult skins. So likewise, and I'm saying that probably in the next two years, all this debate will be obsolete because you'll have 3D organs available. And they're already doing it. I'm told that uh, uh, at uh, King's and other places. This is a beautiful dis uh, discussion on adult tr kidney transplant that Abbas offers, uh, Ghazanfar recorded with me, and it will be on air on Sky 8 to 6 later on this afternoon when I'll be recording something else. These are the different references, several references that are there, and I'm going to stop and say thank you to you. Can I leave? What's the time? I have to yes, be it's only coming up to two. Oh, two? Yeah, we're yeah, yeah, going to yeah. Half two, I must leave. No apologies. Yeah, I've got yeah, plenty of time. Half two. Is this on now? Yeah, great. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. So, uh, my name is Mohammed Saheb. Uh, and uh, as a neurologist, uh, I obviously believe that the heart lies in the CNS. Uh, so, that's my bias, quick opinion. Uh, and for the rest of the day to debate it. Um, on a more serious note, obviously there's a lot to discuss here. Our plan for today was that we turn this into a forum after the speakers all talk, but uh, I hope you agree with me that a few minutes uh, with a few questions with the professor while he's here will be very helpful. Um, I think every topic is not one that could be even answered by a oh. single question, um, but it's important that we at least can start highlighting some of the questions that you had from this presentation in particular. So can I take any... Yes, please, brother, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this cult you I'm see. I'm only a student, remember that. That's fine. We I learn have no more. answers. We can always That's learn more from I said question mark everywhere. <laughs> we can learn more from students, Thank you. <laughs> from the teachers sometimes. Uh, yeah, you said uh, you had a conversation with some religious scholars in Qum about um, yes. Kalb. What I want to know is what do they understand by this Kalb? Is, this is the debate. They say it's Kalb. It's, it's Kalb is the final death is the death of the Kalb. The word is used is Kalb. And Sheikh is here. He'll rectify me. Kalb. And that's the reason I've talked about this. What is Kalb? They say it's the death of the... Kalb does not actually mean organ heart, but they say that God, in fact, I had debate with um, Aqeel Musa, who's my student from Dao, and then he became an Ali Medin from Qum, and he teaches al Mustafa. now he's back to Pakistan. He actually became very cross with me. He said, no, it's Kalb, cannot be brain, nothing to do with brain, brain. And another one was uh, Shabir Mesami, who's a very famous scholar, also my student, doctor, then um, Ali Medin. And they're mustahid. So they believe that's the death of the heart. Well, that's the question. That's the reason I just talked about this. The whole debate, the whole discussion is, my impression is, and the gentleman just said, that qalb does not mean the physical organ heart. Qalb means consciousness, shaur, cognizance. If you go into, if we had the time, we could talk about philosophical aspect of it. There are two elements in philosophy. One is essence, the other one is existence. What is first, essence first or existence first? It's been debate from times of platonic forms from those days. Mullah Sadra changed it. Mullah Sadra is a great philosopher, my favorite. Descartes and Mullah Sadra, they were contemporary. Mullah Sadra said that it has to be, uh, it has to be essence first. Existence comes later. So, in application to this, ruh is first and the body is later. In other words, ruh is already there. When the body comes, the ruh joins it. But that's a different debate. We should not go into it. The answer to your question is that my uh, plea is that qalb means consciousness, central nervous system, brain, not the cardiac death, not the heart. Thank you very much, Professor. Any other questions? Thank you for that presentation. Um, just from the Islamic aspect of it, um, 
the when we discuss it, we're almost discussing qalb and ruh, um, all of these things in almost a material way. And it's difficult not to do so because we're material beings. But leaving and joining um, these terms make no sense when it's an immaterial um, existence. And I think keeping that in mind, so it's, a relation, it's more of a relationship between mm. the immaterial and the material. It's not a leaving and coming. And this is, so one of the discussions is, um, even amongst the uh, Islamic scholars, is that what is the relationship of the soul with the body after death? And it's not, it's not one of leaving. It's, for example, one of attention. Um, and that's a possibility there. So the definition of death remains sometimes obscure, but just because the relationship post-death is not completely clear. So, for example, how long... Uh, so why can you not do certain things to the body straight after death? Why, I mean, um, like devil's advocate, what the argument would be is because of the attention to the soul, to the, to the body, the attention of the soul to the body. Um, and you can't talk about pain in the soul because again, where pain is um, part of the physical world. But there's all this, that relationship between the soul and the body because it's not completely resolved and how long that soul keeps attention towards the body. It's very difficult to give an Islamic definition of death, which would be um, definitive, at least. Um. This debate has been going on for at least 400 years. Uh, and that is the question I raised, that we don't know what time the soul actually, see lots of ahadis, 40 days, 120 days and things. In one of the debates that I had a very famous uh, scholar and a doctor in Iran, uh, it's not advisable to name the name. Uh, he, he talked about a very interesting thing. He said, if you look at the embryology, and there's a famous video available by Professor Keith Miller, uh, Keith Moore, I'm sorry, not Miller, Keith Moore. <coughs> he was a professor of embryology who uh, taught in Saudi Arabia for many years, and he became Muslim because he read embryology through Quran. It's an amazing video. And somewhere along the pathway, he says that on a certain day, and that is, I think, um, 14 days, not one second more, not one second less, neural crest develops. And that's also the time when the primordial heart develops. So heart and nervous system are developing exactly at 14 days after fertilization. And he believes, and this gentleman in Iran said, that that is probably the time when cognizance starts. And cognizance means life. Cognizance means ruh. So is that the time when the ruh starts? And again, I'm saying, it's not the question of entering. Although Quran says, nufuk, is the word? Yeah, nufuk too. And I must acknowledge our ignorance in Arabic. And I think Dr. Allama Aqil Gharvi only last week told us, we had a meeting with him, he said, you should learn Arabic, because Arabic is really, anyway, the point is that, is it the the entry of ruh and leaving, that concept puzzles me. What I feel is, and this is only a person and two debates and things, that ruh is there, life is there in everything. If you look at the quark, even the quark is alive, spinning all the time, electron, photon, proton, and things, everything. So life is of a different nature, vegetative, non-vegetative, etc., different type. At a certain stage, this life emerges from a chemical reaction at a point when it becomes a different from a certain static to vegetative life and vegetative to non-vegetative and so forth. Evolution is continuing all the time. The question, what time does the body leave the soul? That is the question. We don't know. Can I make one sure. um, suggestion? So maybe if we could look at the discussion of human and non-human. When does it become human oh, yes. as per the Islamic definition and when does it stop being human? So it's possible that it's um, alive, yes. but not human per yes. the definition, yes. and dead. Yeah. Uh, and when, when it dies, it's no longer, it's still alive, it still has, um, it's a body that might still yes. be functioning in yes. some ways, but it's not human. Yeah. And we might be able to resolve some questions if we're able I'll to. I'll send you the video, the recording that I did, a lecture on what is life. Mm. It's available on YouTube. Yeah. We'll forward it to the group if you email it. We'll yeah, yeah. It. It's, I've done this series on Alibad TV because of what I told you. My, my, this is the point I raise. That is the different. We have to differentiate between life at a different stages. Once the life becomes humane life, or not human, but human life, 
then that is the time when probably the rue enters. But what is that time? You cannot tell it with precision. Just like this, I said, okay, when does rue leave the body? So when you're doing organ harvesting or doing the burials, is the rue still there or not? Thank you very much, Professor Ayer. The, the, as you can see, Thank very you. deep and uh, a large amount of problems, I think. I want to take a question from the from one of the sisters, if they've got one, um, and then we'll probably close that up on you. That's, someone just going to come with a microphone, if that's okay. Um, if the death is caused by the brain, how would someone be able to have a brain transplant? Brain transplant? You can't have a brain transplant. The latest we had was a gentleman, Professor Naveed Sayed. He gave a lecture on IMI's annual dinner on 10th of March. You should listen. You should listen. You should listen to it. It's on YouTube. Yes, and I was there. He's a person who's a scientist who's developed the first brain machine silicon interface chip. So somebody asked him a question, a neurologist asked him, can brain regenerate? And his answer was yes. And we were all flabbergasted because we always thought the brain does not regenerate. And he's a top scientist, almost going to the level of Nobel. He's a famous scientist, Naveed Sayyad. Then somebody asked him, he said, neuroplasticity is not regeneration, but there is an activity that in certain, like um, hippocampus, is it hippocamp hippocampus? hippocampus and amygdala, amygdala. yeah. Amygdala. Some Synaptic cells. Synaptic yes. regeneration is yes. possible. Yes. So nobody has attempted the brain transplant. No, you can't. Maybe you do do one day. Uh, yeah, may maybe. I think my life must be very long for that. Um, don't create a Frankenstein, though. No, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, I've got another question, Zamania. Someone bring the microphone. Thanks, sir. Forgive my ignorance in advance. I'm not a medical person. Um, I'm just trying to understand the significance of. The, the timely the time of death mm -hmm. because you know there's going to be uh, potentially a few minutes between maybe the heart stopping and the final brain activity and whatever that means and whatever that number of minutes is how significant is it because if you say to me actually in those few minutes 90 percent of the organs the necessary organs uh, waste away mm -hmm. and are long are useless that becomes the ex yes. extremely important but if on the other hand you tell me actually the majority of yes. the times, that's not, neither here nor there. Actually, it doesn't really matter because most of us, when we die, you know, whether it's an accident or whatever it might be, those few minutes are meaningless yeah. and okay. therefore we can, this becomes a topic, you know, a very small topic in the grand scheme. Yes. So perhaps you can shed some light very there. Very interesting question. I think I did mention it, that uh, you can keep the organs alive and that is the whole intention because you want to gain that time. Once the brain has been declared dead, you want to keep the organs alive and active through artificial ventilation, circulation, pumping, etc. The heart is pumping all the time through art. You want to keep it alive because when you remove them within a set, and this is about 24 hours time that Abbas Ghazanfar told me, that within 24 hours you must transplant it. And that is why the teams are running parallel. One team is removing, the other one is preparing some. It's not a question of a few seconds and things. The debate is more theosophical. In terms of actual organ harvesting, the question that I have raised is not question of death, what is death, etc., but what is what, the role of rue? Is the rue still there or not? That is my problem. Death, by definition, according to scientists, humble student of science like me, is the death of the brain, the, the CNS system, neurological system, not the heart. Heart can be revived, like in my case. For example, there are hundreds of people. The question of timing is only if, free, and that is why there are teams which are running all over. There is a national pool in the UK. In the USA, there is more. They have helicopters, etc. So timing, as such, is not relevant because you can retain and can maintain these organs for up to 24 hours. Sometimes, people have been kept alive on the uh, ventilators for six months, even longer, and that's another debate. When you put a patient onto assisted living system. Be very careful. Discuss with the family the implications of it, psychological, social, economic, etc., and the question of distributive justice, that are you depriving other people of the services that could have gone otherwise? Because that's very important. If you remember John Rawls' theory of justice, is a very important theory, which is pertinent particularly to UK and the NHS. The question is, 
you can maintain and can keep the organs alive for a certain length of time, but eventually they'll decay. And from one human body, you can save seven bodies. And Adib is we say 70 bodies. Everything can be harvested. Thank you very much, Professor. I think uh, we'll end it there. Thank you so much. Uh, if we can so have grateful. a combination of a uh, round of applause and a salawat for Professor. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to you. Do forgive me for my ignorance. 